Carolina. I am at Aubrey Diorio on Twitter. And I am Caitlin McCommons. I am a second grade teacher in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I am at Caitlin1339. We are going to share some um, tech-based tools that you can use for inquiry today, um, and specifically with a focus on littles, littles being students who are ages K through second grade. And we're going to talk about tools to use and also how to get started in your classroom with the inquiry process if you have the tools but you're not quite sure what to do with them. So we would love for you to follow us on Twitter. And as you are sharing out your learning today, um, our hashtag is hashtag innovate for littles. And the hashtag for today's session is hashtag the ed collab uh, gathering ha space hashtag nine, session number nine. And again, I am Caitlin McCommons and I can be found on Twitter at Caitlin1339, always looking for new followers. Um, and you can also, um, this is our email addresses and our websites. Uh, feel free to send us an email if you have any questions about anything we're doing today. And feel free to check out um, either of our websites for more information. So our agenda today is um, we're going to first talk about how to get started with inquiry. Then we're going to look at some search tools that you can use with Littles. Then we are going to talk about some tech tools that you can use for sharing the inquiry that your littles have discovered. And then we're going to round out by talking about more ways to use tech and just emphasizing that littles can do it too. All right, so first we're going to talk about why you want to use an inquiry-based model in your classroom. Um, first and foremost, it is a relationship builder. Um, as Rita Pearson says, kids don't learn from, kid, from people they don't like. And... Um, and using an inquiry model allows you to build relationships because you're able to find the things that kids are interested in and um, build build their build a relationship by making sure you're including those things in your classroom. Uh, it's a great way to include the four C's in your classroom and in your instruction on a regular basis. The four C's being creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. Um, it also allows for real world practice and real world um, application of anything that you're doing within your curriculum. And it absolutely has a focus on student interests and the things that they're interested in, the things that they want to learn, their curiosities and their wonders. Um, it also lends itself great into student choice because like we said with student interest, it's allowing your children to have some choice and some um, some choice over what they're learning. It flows perfectly with 21st century skills that they need to be learning and preparing them for not just receiving information, but how to go out and seek answers to those questions that they might have. Um, it lends itself to a deeper understanding across the board of the curriculum that they're learning. And finally, and most importantly, it's just fun. It's fun, it's engaging, and the kids really enjoy it. So next we're gonna talk about how to get into inquiry. So there are a couple different ways that you can do this. Um, you can do it by simply just asking a question of the day. There are lots of different ways that you can do this. You can start by just saying things like, what do you notice about the world today? What do you notice about what's going on outside today? Um, you can start by using something called Wonderopolis. It's a wonderful website that has different questions and it links to information underneath. Um, you can have kids post their questions that they have and their inquiries that they have on a wonder wall in your classroom. And that then lends itself to you take those questions each day and you try to figure out ways that you can answer those. Um, you can also use a wonder notebook, which we have a picture of. If you don't have the wall space or I'm in a classroom that I have to remove, uh, move out of every nine weeks, my kids keep their inquiries and questions in a notebook. Some other ways that you can get into inquiry would be from um, doing mini, mini inquiries in your classroom. 
Um, mini inquiries being something that takes just a short, shorter period of time where the kids are um, able to ask a question and then do some research on, on, um, on the topic that they're wondering. Um, you can also do PBLs with your kids, uh, PBLs being project or problem-based learning. Um, where you are focused on specific curriculum standards, solving a specific problem, um, at answering a specific question, um, and the kids are able to do some research through project or problem-based learning, as well as Genius Hour, which is a little bit more intense where everybody is asking their own question about their own things they're wondering and then doing their research and building from there. Um, <laughs> and Genius Hour being probably the most intense way to incorporate inquiry into your um, classroom. All right, so um, both of us do inquiry in our classroom on a regular basis. So we're gonna talk real quick about um, when we incorporate those different things in, um, in our classroom. Um, so I am able to incorporate some project-based learning. Um, I do, each of my um, science and social studies units are done more through a project-based learning format where the kids are conducting some, inch, some uh, research as well as um, building things using our, our in-classroom makerspace to solve a problem or um, do some research. And both of us do Genius Hour, and I'm gonna let Caitlin talk a little bit about, about Genius Hour. Yes, so I do Genius Hour in my classroom. It really winds up being about a Genius 45 um, because we don't always have the hour long time to devote to it, but we do it usually on Friday afternoons, coming starting at about 2.45, which is our last kind of block of the day, till about 3.30. But really, it's a time when I tell my kids we have devoted to doing nothing else but working on your inquiries. And it looks different depending on what it is that your students need. Sometimes my genius hour time has looked like students doing research projects on things. Sometimes my inquiry has been students needing and wanting to make things. Um, at the beginning of the year, my genius hour tends to look a lot like playing board games and learning those soft skills that they need in order to get along and work collaboratively in those groups. But it's basically a time of the day that we have set aside in order to make sure that we are purposefully teaching and giving kids time to work on those wonders and those inquiries. You can also do it though throughout the day if you don't have a full chunk of time, you can do it in terms of posing a question at the end of a science lesson or a reading lesson or a math lesson that would lend itself to doing a little bit more inquiry-based work. Um, and you can also do it at different, different parts during the day. I think both of us usually try to get in our science and social studies lessons within um, four days out of the week so that we're able to devote that time then to Genius Hour. Uh, but this year I've also been able to do some Genius Hour work and inquiry work within our writer's workshop um, where the kids spent some time working with their all about books and they were able to conduct some research in small groups or even individually and write a book using the topics that they were specifically focused on doing research and learning about. And we do a lot of our inquiry as well during that writing period because when we have a specific set of standards that we are given by our state in order to, to teach the children, and oftentimes it's things that are nonfiction standards. So things like the children need to write an informational text. Well, that's really great because that informational text can then be based on whatever the student's choice may be. So you can hit that standard by having them do an all about book and it may be an animal or it may be a person or it may be an all about how to make something. So those standards in writing oftentimes really lend themselves to some good inquiry time. Okay, so we are gonna share with you some ways that we uh, keep track of our wonders. So we had <laughs> mentioned earlier that we use wonder walls and wonder notebooks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that picture on the right, which is the wonder notebooks. They are notebooks that are single subject and I literally picked them up from 
um, stores that we have here called the dollar store and everything is a dollar and it's awesome. And um, the kids then just open up the notebook each day and start with a, I wonder about, I wonder about. Sometimes they do it at the end of a science lesson if they have more questions about it. Sometimes they can do it in the morning during their morning work time. Um, it just depends, but that's how we keep track of what our wonders are because we are moving every nine weeks to a different classroom. So we don't always have the wall space. All right, and um, in my classroom, I use a wonder wall and have also incorporated some wonder notebooks. Um, I don't move classrooms as much as Caitlin does. Um, so I'm able to devote some space to a wonder wall. Um, my students post their questions on sticky notes and then they hang them up on the walls. And this is where they get some of their uh, inspiration when it comes to genius hour. They're able to take a question off the wall and then work on doing some research to answer that question. And you'll see here, this wonder wall is actually from my kindergarten classroom when I taught kindergarten the last five years. And um, you'll notice that some of the sticky notes have a single word, some of the sticky notes have questions, and some of the sticky notes just have pictures. It's really important when working with inquiry and littles that you take them where they're at and move them forward from there. Uh, some kids are able to communicate with full sentences and questions. Some kids are only able to communicate through um, single words or f word phrases, and some kids are only able to communicate using pictures. And um, I allow them to communicate their wonders and their questions in any way that's accessible for them. And I have to say, you'll see a little bit further along in the presentation an actual picture out of one of my wonder notebooks for my students. And they still use pictures in second grade because oftentimes it's easier for them to draw a diagram of what it is that they're wondering about and like draw a picture to. But I'm wondering how that piece fits in. Yep. Um, any combination of written communication is really good for students of any age. Uh, the photo here in the middle is um, it's labeled as an exit slip. I used it during a PBL that my students in kindergarten completed to go with uh, the weather. And you'll see that they reflected on something that they learned that day and they wrote the different uh, the different kinds of clouds. And then at the bottom, they asked a question, something based on what they already learned that day, what questions they're still wondering, so that we're continuously bringing our learning forward as they are working through things. And the question they wrote is, what are clouds made of? So these are just some pictures of our kiddos doing um, different types of inquiry. So on the left, You'll notice that I there was a picture of a genius hour fidget spinner. I had a student that was desperate to have a fidget spinner, and they just went over to my makerspace that I had in my classroom, and they, from observing different types of fidget spinners that friends had, they went and created their own. Um, you'll also notice in that second picture that there are students doing a research project there, and one of my favorite pieces of that photo is that I um, have children in my classroom that push in for only certain moments of the day because they are um, accessing the curriculum that uh, in a way that works best for them outside of the classroom. And when you do inquiry, it levels the playing field for everyone. So there are students in that photo working with various different skill sets and they're all able to work together in the group. Uh, the third picture here is a picture of one of my students engrossed in building a zip line. This was part of a PBL that we had completed in order to solve a problem that they identified at recess. And you'll see that he's also using makerspace materials, but that we use multiple different types of materials to combine um, as we're building at makerspace. So um, as Caitlin, you can see in Caitlin's uh, Genius Hour fidget spinner over there that it looks like reusable materials, where my friend here in the middle is using um, Legos and dowels and <laughs> some pieces of furniture from the classroom and kind of combining all of those things together uh, as he's working and building. Um, and you'll even see in the background that my kids use recyclable and reusable materials as well. There's some uh, boxes back there. Um, and then uh, the group of kids here on the right had just completed a STEM challenge in which they were given some um, dollar store recyclable reusable materials from our makerspace and they had to create a boat that would float and they're here testing 
that boat in a tub of water and it did end up floating and they are also proud of themselves. Um, so just a quick, quick recap <clears throat> is that when you are incorporating inquiry in your classroom, um, that you can use multiple different methods to incorporate that inquiry. We have, um, as you saw, some genius hour, some student research, and PBLs, as well as genius hour. Um, all of those good are all of those are ways to incorporate inquiry in your classroom. And inquiry also allows you to kind of embed some reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills as well as those soft skills and questions and all of those things. So when you're thinking about inquiry, sometimes it can seem overwhelming because you're trying to figure out, well, how am I going to fit all of those standards that I have to teach into inquiry-based learning? Um, number one, I would say just jump in, start it, um, but begin with your end in mind. Think about what are the standards really asking of your students to learn and what do you want them to get out of the unit that you're going to try and create. Um, if it's a nonfiction text unit that you're trying to teach some different nonfiction text, um, text structures, what is it that you really want them to learn? Do you want them to learn specifically about an animal or do you want them to learn about nonfiction text structures? In which case they can do that using multiple different ways. Um, so we're gonna show you some pictures of some specific curriculum based standards projects that our kids have done um, in just a moment. And <clears throat> um, You'll, what we ended up doing as we started getting into inquiry work is we really looked at our curriculum standards, what it is we're trying to teach the kids and what we want them to know, and not necessarily just the resources that are provided to us by our school district. Um, and so you'll see here, um, actually, I'll let Caitlin start because her picture's on the left side. So on the left, you'll notice that those students all have instruments that they have created in their hands. So we did an entire unit on sound, what makes sound, how is sound made, pitch, vibration. And then what the students did was they took materials that were available to them in the makerspace, uh, in the makerspace we have in our classroom, which is things like paper plates, cotton balls, strings, dowels, all types of things that have been donated to the class. And they created their own instruments. And some of them created instruments that actually worked. Some of them did not, but that was part of the process, them discovering through um, what they knew about sound, which ones would and which ones wouldn't work. And then on the right here um, are two of my students who had created a full football field um, as a prototype using makerspace materials as something they'd like to add to our recess, our recess space at our school in order to solve a problem of students getting hurt at recess or students having constant conflicts at recess. Um, and this ties into the curriculum standard as part of our social studies content where students are supposed to be able to explain how um, humans affect their community and the environment. So we already spoke a little bit about this, but when can you get these inquiry pieces end? And like we had said, and like we've shown, it can happen in a science unit, in a math unit, in a um, reading time it can, or writing. It can also though occur right when um, you have that time specifically devoted to it in the afternoon. Oftentimes students will choose to um, take a little bit of their genius hour time that they have at the end and continue on with units that we have already been talking about in science or in social studies or they will replicate uh, sorry, duplicate um, science experiments that we've already done that they want to try again and do on their own which is great because all of those pieces are just strengthening the knowledge that they have um, and I'll say that some of this for us has been our own kind of PBL and our own genius hour as we um, as we are learning more about our kids and we're learning more about this inquiry process as mm -hmm. as teachers, as educators, um, we have not done it the same way multiple times. Each time both of us have yeah. made tweaks to our own um, our own instruction and our own styles of teaching and facilitating this inquiry process for our students. And I think what Aubrey said was really important when she talked about listening to her kids, your kids will oftentimes tell you 
what they need during that inquiry time. Last year, I had a group of students that really needed those soft skills directly taught to them during that inquiry time. So we did a lot of um, team building type things, game board playing, things of that nature to get them to that point. And that sometimes can be what your genius hour looks like if that's what your yes. students are telling you that they need. Yeah, and it's really important to kind of prepare yourself in your brain because inquiry, especially genius hour inquiry, is messy. It's going to get noisy. It's going to look chaotic. It's going to feel chaotic. And as the facilitator of that learning, it's important for you to go ahead and embrace that chaos, mm -hmm. expect it to come, expect for it to be there, and 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 run with it and watch your kids and learn from your kids mm -hmm. and let your kids learn on their own and learn from each other. And it does take a shift in mindset where you kind of have to give up a little bit of that control, but you can do it a little bit at a time by just starting by letting them choose a topic for the project they're going to do. <clears throat> and then you can broaden it into, okay, let's do genius hour. You don't have to jump off into starting with something giant like genius hour. Although if you want to, <laughs> I totally support that. Yes. Um, yeah, like she said, it's really important to just kind of get your toes wet. You don't need to throw everything out that you're already doing um, because teachers already are doing the things that are best for their kids in their own classrooms. And so if you're getting started in inquiry, take it as a process and go ahead and just get started and pick maybe one thing that we've talked about and shared about today and just try that one little thing. And as you go, maybe you revisit this video or you connect with us on Twitter or take a look at our websites and then you find the next thing that you want to try and then take yourself a little bit further into your inquiry, into your own like inquiry of teaching. So now we're going to switch a little bit and we're going to talk about if you've got that inquiry piece, how can you help your kids to facilitate and share what it is that they have learned? So two of our favorite ways that we have um, for helping them to um, get more gain more inquiry is Kid Racks and YouTube Kids. So Kid Racks is a um, site, a search engine that is specifically geared towards children. They can type in their search in the search box, anything it is that they are looking for, and um, it will bring up kid-friendly um, articles and things for them to read. You still, as a good teacher, have to be watching them while they're doing this to make sure, but it is done by Google and it's a kid-friendly um, search engine for them to use. Uh, YouTube Kids is also another great tool that kids can use for research. Um, and it's important to point out to kids that anybody can upload to YouTube. And this is a good time to teach them critical thinking, one of your four C's, and that they need to be critical consumers because as they're watching YouTube videos, they need to be paying attention for um, who put this video out? Are they really an expert? Is this really true facts? Are these things that I can learn from? Or is this just somebody in their backyard that's putting out the information? It's really important in the digital age to make sure kids have the skills and tools they need to be able to analyze the content they're taking in, even as littles. What I like about YouTube kids is kids don't have to be able to type to do their searching. They can talk to this. This is an app, it's not web-based. Um, so you should be able to get it um, on Google Play or on the App Store. Um, <clears throat> but they are able <laughs> to, um, to look at these videos and they're able to take in way more content and more complex content through a video than they would necessarily be able to take in through reading a text. So these are just some pictures of our littles using some of these um, research tools. On the left, you'll notice these kiddos are, some of my kiddos, and they are using um, Kid Racks, and they're looking at different maps of different things. In the middle, that's some more of my kiddos, and they are in the process of watching a video from YouTube Kids and transferring it onto the um, paper that they're going to be presenting. And on the right is a group of first graders looking at YouTube Kids, and um, Real quick, I'm going to tell a quick story about what was going on in this video or in this photo is the kids were trying to figure out um, what the sun is made of. 
and they were watching some video and they were like, uh, Mrs. Diorio, this doesn't seem right. It's all cartoons and they're giggling and laughing. And I don't think that I'm going to find the answer to my question. And then I said, all right, well, if that video is not going to answer your question, do you have to keep watching it? And they said, well, no, I think that I should see if I can find something different, maybe a scientist video. So they went back into the search tool on YouTube Kids and they were able to then find a video that would look more like it was going to teach them the facts that they were looking for. <clears throat> so once you, once your littles have figured out that this is what they want to inquiry, do their inquiry on, and they have figured out the questions and the answers to what it is that they have done, you then want to have them share. And this is one of the most important processes, parts of the inquiry process, is allowing them to share their learning with the class. It can be something as amazing as having parents come in and watch a giant um, presentation, but it can also be something that's ongoing and smaller. And two of our favorite tools are Seesaw and Flipgrid. We're just going to explain those a little bit to you. All right. So Seesaw is um, one of, for both of us, I think, one of our most favorite um, tech tools to use in our classrooms. And um, the way that you get into Seesaw is an app. It's also web-based. It's free. Um, kids are able to use it independently. They are able to upload anything they want to, uh, create their own content, reflect on their learning, ask questions, comment on each other. Um, and it's so simple to use um, that kindergartners are able to use it independently without, with very little instruction because it's so intuitive. Uh, kids are able to upload photos, videos, drawings, notes, and it even co connects with Google Apps, so they can upload Google Apps through Seesaw, as well as posting links that they're finding. So like if there's something from Wonderopolis that they want to share, um, they're able to share that through a link on Seesaw, and it is absolutely phenomenal. And then once, they're, once they get some content into Seesaw, they can then annotate it by adding labels, by adding captions. Um, are you hearing all of these text features that we're supposed to be teaching when it comes to our um, uh, nonfiction text in our in our lessons in our classrooms, right? Um, and Seesaw kind of provides like a real hands-on experience for kids to be able to to use and apply those things. And the reason, one another reason that I love Seesaw so much is that it spans the grade levels from K to 12 because it's just open-ended. You create a video. Well, a kindergartner may create a video that looks very different from a second grader or a fifth grader. I have second graders right now creating videos explaining how to solve three-digit subtraction problems. And especially in the States when you have common core math and parents going, I have no idea what it is you're trying to get my child to do. When you have something like Seesaw and they're able to share what their learning is and share their inquiry pieces, then the parents are able to see on a daily basis and not having to just wait for that big reveal at the end. Yes. Um, another great tool that we love to use is Flipgrid. We both have Flipgrid fever. We love it. It is a quick, um, I think a minute and 20 seconds is the longest that you can do, but it is a video app where the children can take selfie videos and they can explain what it is they're learning, what it is that they um, their question was, but it is simple for them to use. It is literally a hit the green plus button and they're making a video. The only other students that can see the videos are the students in the class. You create a class for your students. They can do emoji comments on each other or they can actually create video, uh, new videos that are responses to the videos that the students have made. And that's another great way because especially for littles, when you're talking kindergarten, when you first start, they may not be able to write as nearly as much as they can video and talk about. One thing that we like about both of these tools is that they're intuitive. They kind of work the same. So there's a plus sign, which means I'm going to add something here. Um, and then there are arrow buttons or check mark buttons that kind of take you through the process of uploading and sharing um, whatever content it is that the kids are creating. Um, uh, and they're both safe. 
They protect the kids' privacy, both Flipgrid and Twitter. Um, put the kids first. And the only people who can have access to the things that kids are sharing through Seesaw and Flipgrid are the people that you as the teacher are allowing the kids to, or allowing to see it. Um, Seesaw can be shared with parents easily and parents get one specific code that only connects them to their own child's work, uh, which I think is really important. And Flipgrid, is protected by a code. So long as you don't give that code out to somebody, nobody can see what your kids are posting, their faces, their names, their videos, anything like that. Uh, so both of these tools are very safe for kids to be using. Yes, and they're also both free. And they have wide ranges of things that you can use for free, which is always important. Yes. Um, and so part of the inquiry process is being able to share your learning and share your work with the world, which is why we selected both Seesaw and Twitter as our top tools for sharing, um, sharing kids learning. <clears throat> um, because it's really important for them to share what's going on in their brains, to share what's going on in their worlds with the people that are important, the most important to them. Uh, both of these photos here are first grade videos. And um, on the left, you'll see a friend who is getting ready to upload to Seesaw. And she's posting something to her friends that she was getting ready or that she had learned about during her genius hour time. And then what she'll end up doing when she's finished there is going back through our Seesaw feed, which works basically like social media. And she can then look and listen to her friends as they are sharing. And um, she can leave them voice comments or text comments comments uh, as, on their own on their work and then the little girl on the right here is taking a video using she had used Oreo cookies to explain the cycle of the moon and she is teaching mommy and daddy about how the moon waxes and wanes and the cycle of that process so these are just some more awesome tools that you can use for inquiry. Um, Kittle is a, mostly an image search that you can use. Google Classroom is a great one for you to use. There's Wonderopolis, which we talked about. That is the question of the day um, website. There's Buncee, Discovery Education. Uh, then we also have Book Creator, which is another way that kids can create content. Um, Padlet, which is a way that kids are able to kind of collect their ideas in an organized format. Pebble Go and Discovery Ed are both paid options for research. Discovery Ed, which has all different types of content uh, for kids. It has video, photographs, text, all kinds of different things, um, but it does span K-12 content, so you do have to be careful and supervise. Um, all of it is appropriate for kids K-12, but then you have to think that things for a 12th grader is not going to be necessarily appropriate for a first grader or a second grader. Uh, Pebble Go has some fantastic photographs and text um, that is easily interpret interpreted by children. And it has a read to me feature that is just second to none, especially for kindergartners. I love that read to me feature on Pebble Go. Um, I find that my kids, my first graders like to go to Pebble Go and they'll read it to themselves and then they'll listen to it read to them so that they're kind of taking in that content in multiple formats. And that really enhances their comprehension. Um, and then Chatterpix is another great way for kids to share their learning. Um, this Chatterpix Smash is fantastic with both Seesaw and Flipgrid because the kids can take a picture in Chatterpix, draw a mouth, and then record their voice teaching or explaining the thing that they had researched and learned about. Then that video that they made um, can be saved to your camera roll and then uploaded to either Seesaw or um, Flipgrid to be shared with the child's world. Um, Google App Expeditions um, really probably should be more on the left side of this because it goes more with Kittle and Wonderopolis because it can be used more as a research tool. Um, but it's basically like an AR VR um, in the classroom where kids can kind of go out into the world 
virtually at, to learn about different things and actually see those things as they would look in the real world. So we were doing just a quick on Google expeditions. We were learning about ancient Egypt and we actually went on a Google expedition and saw the pyramids of Giza and those types of things that they wouldn't have gotten to see that way. They would have just seen like a picture of. So um, these are some resources. So you've heard all about inquiry, all about how amazing it is. And you're thinking, I don't know where to begin, though. Well, these are three great ways that you can begin. One is reading the book called The Curious Classroom. It talks all about a school in North Carolina named the Duke School and also a, a couple other schools. But it just gives you some good practical ways that you can start inquiry in your classroom tomorrow. That's what I love most about it. It was one of the first books I read. It says things like, tomorrow, when you walk into your classroom, do this one thing. So it's a very kind of step-based way to start some inquiry in your yeah. classroom. Our favorite thing about the Curious Classroom is that it breaks inquiry down into bite-sized manageable pieces for people who are just getting started. Um, Hacking Project-Based Learning by Ross Cooper and Aaron Murphy um, is another great resource if you are looking into getting started with PBLs in your classroom. This gives you um, 10, they call, they're called hacks, um, quick ways to kind of begin this process in your classroom. Um, and things that you can do tomorrow is ways to, as well as um, research support uh, for when you get pushback as you're going through this process and in kind of transforming your classroom into an inquiry base. Uh, the Buck, Buck Institute for Education is another phenomenal resource for inquiry and project-based learning ideas. Um, it has templates to help you plan with, and it has some completed PBLs that teachers have shared and posted. Um, I will caution you to read them thoroughly because they're not necessarily vetted before they're put out there. So the main thing that we want everyone to take away from this is that it is never too young to start the inquiry process and to let your kids start to have some control and ownership in their classroom. Littles can do it too. It can start in kindergarten. It can start in first grade. It can start in second grade. Littles deserve to have just as much say over their learning course as bigs do. And Kids are naturally curious. Littles especially are constantly asking questions. And as the adults that are closest to them, it's our job to capitalize on their curiosities and make sure that we are um, doing the best that we can to encourage them to continue to be curious and to continue asking questions and wondering different things about the world around them. Um, and like we said before, and as you've heard Miss Frizzle say, I'm sure mm -hmm. in, in multiple, multiple stories, that it's just important to jump in and get messy and ask questions. And it's not going to be perfect and you are going to make mistakes, but really this is where authentic learning happens, especially for littles. And we really just both encourage you to try and just jump in and pick one thing and try. Exactly. And if we are asking things of our children that we are not willing to do ourselves, then what's the point? And one of the biggest things that we ask children to do is to take risks and learn new things. And we have to model that. And the best way to model that is by taking risks and trying new things. And again, it can start small. You do not have to jump into the deep end of this pool. You can start by just asking your kids a question each day during a science or a math lesson and going through an inquiry process with them there, taking five minutes out of a day. You can do it at the end of the day. You can do it at the beginning of the day. You can do it through Wonderopolis where it's all kind of structured out for you and you're just kind of having that discussion with them. It can start small or you can jump in and get messy and start big. Um, but we wanna leave you with the idea that a littles can do it too. We are both on Twitter. We both will supply our emails and we would love to contact and uh, stay in contact with um, people that are continuing to try these things and we will share. If you have any questions about anything that we've talked about so far, um, we're getting ready to put up a link to our own Flipgrid, and we would love for you to, um, you can scan the QR on the screen, you can use the link, or if you're already familiar and have Flipgrid as an app, you can use the Flipgrid code that we're putting out for you right now. Um, 
And there are a few different grids and a few different topics in there. And we would love to connect with you through this method. Um, please share with us a big takeaway, a success that you've had in your classroom or any further questions that you're still wondering. And even if we are not um, able to answer, or we are not the ones that get back to you first. That's the beauty of Flipgrid is that somebody else may sign on and they may have an answer to that question and then they may have their own. So we can kind of all be learning from each other as we go through this process of starting yes. and strengthening inquiry in our yes. classrooms. We will leave this Flipgrid open so that you can come back to it. So please watch each other's videos, leave comments for each other, share this Flipgrid with other educators that are into inquiry, want to get started with inquiry, or are um, inquiry experts. Caitlin and I are not trying to be inquiry experts. We are just cheerleaders. <laughs> Um, and again, our hashtag is hashtag innovate for littles. And the hashtag for this session is hashtag uh, ed collab gathering, hashtag number nine. And please email, tweet, let us know, contact us on Flipgrid. We would love to hear from you. We hope you got some takeaways from this. And anything that you're doing in your classroom, we would love for you to be able to hashtag our hashtag innovate for littles as well. But thank you, Aubrey. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so much, so much amazing learning all in 45 minutes. Thank you so much <laughs> for teaching us to embrace, you know, project based learning. Um, yeah, taking small st uh, steps towards big successes with inquiry and so many great resources. So we thank will you. continue to use your hashtag yes. and um, and the resources that you're going to put out on Twitter. Yeah. So thank you very yeah. much for that. For those of you who have joined us for this fabulous session, there's so much good learning coming up soon. So I hope you stay with us. Um, up next in our next session, we have Joellen McCarthy and uh, Catherine and Todd talking about possibilities of using books as co-teachers. We also have um, Jamie talking about uh, how student-centered coaching, the when, why, who, and where of student-centered coaching. Fabulous workshop for, especially if you are a literacy specialist or a liter literacy coach. And then we also have uh, Carla Cruz and Blair talking about elective teachers unite literacy in the non-tested subjects. I do hope you stay on for those workshops coming up next. And our closing is going to be fabulous. So please stay with us. Um, thanks once again to our fabulous presenters for today, Caitlin and Aubrey. Thanks so much for everything. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.